speaking up and active, people active in their communities, that I'm not talking about a fringe minority or a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the mainstream media. The media today represents a minority elite. These all have to be challenged, and many people are doing it. It's Michael Franti here. This is Amy Goodman with Rochester. Rochester Indie Media. Hi, you're watching Rochester Indie TV. I'm the Barefoot host, Dawn, and today's program is very exciting because I'm not the only one barefoot today. I always offer guests to come and take their shoes off, you know, feel the carpet, feel the floor, and I invite you guys to do that at home or wherever you are, and let's just, you know, keep it real, put some feeling into this because this topic today has a lot of feeling, and it's a very um, intense topic that's really misrepresented in the corporate media, and so we're going to talk about it from a whole different perspective today and here to do that are two of our guests from Farm Workers Legal Services and we have Owen Thompson and Renan Salgado and we're going to use this show time to talk about a very controversial hot intense topic human trafficking so really listen closely to this what you guys have to say thank you for coming I appreciate you guys being here thank you for having us. Yeah, yes thank you. let's start with uh, doesn't it feel good? The carpet's not bad, right? You know, just like kind of rub in a little bit, settle in. Uh, Owen, tell me first, uh, what is um, Farm Worker Legal Services and what you do there and some of the projects? Sure, please. we're a small law office based here in Rochester, right by East High on Culver, by Maine. We are a small law office, like I said, two attorneys and five and a half paralegals or outreach workers. We do mainly um, uh, employment law and civil rights law, so helping people, especially farm workers with trouble in the workplace on a wide range of issues, but then we also have special projects dealing with pesticides, domestic violence in the farm worker community, and human trafficking in the farm worker community. And both Renan and, uh, both Renan and myself are advocates under the anti-trafficking project at Farm Worker Legal Services, or mm -hmm. FLISNI as we call it. Mm -hmm. And Renan and I have talked about this. This is mm -hmm. why this is going to be an ongoing series because there are so many topics regarding farm workers and the conditions and the situations with the pesticides and the domestic violence. So we're really going to try to focus today on human trafficking. Uh, what is human trafficking and who are the um, people that you're seeing specifically in your work? Well, so um, basically anyone who is a farm worker in New York State is at pretty high risk for human trafficking. And to give a little bit of background on who the farm workers are in this state, <laughs> it's gone to the point where it's about 85% Mexicans, mostly born in Mexico and migrating here. Um, previously on a season-to-season -season basis, now usually staying in the U.S. for a few years and moving up and down the East Coast. Those are most of the people we get in Rochester. There's a growing population, though, of, uh, of migrants coming from Central America, particularly Guatemala and from within Mexico coming from the south of Mexico, states like uh, Oaxaca and Chiapas with largely indigenous populations. There's also a shrinking populations of Jamaican workers who are mostly coming on visas, Haitian workers, and, um, and a very small shrinking population of African-American, U.S. citizen, American-born workers. But so it's mainly Mexican and Central American workers at this point. And human trafficking, I mean, is this just another name for what slavery was, indentured servitude? What is human trafficking? Well, that's a good, that's a very good question. As it tends to be used in the popular context and conversational, in the today's sort of conversational language, human trafficking is just sort of a synonym for modern day slavery. And there's a lot of truth in that. But to get more specific and to get uh, into the legal definition of what human trafficking is, and as uh, unlegal terms as I can use, human trafficking is about using force, fraud, or, or coercion, for example, threats of force or things like that, to make someone perform labor for you. So they can get paid for it. For, so and in that sense, it's important to distinguish, is it slavery or not? Slavery has become a lot more complicated in modern times. Back in the day, slavery was, you're in chains, you're not getting paid, you're working for me, you're not free to go. Trafficking is a broad definition of slavery, essentially, that encompasses situations where someone is being forced 
through violence or through the th threat of violence or through psychological violence or simply through lies and misrepresentations of, or false promises to do work for someone that they're essentially not free to leave. Even if they're physically free to walk out of some place, maybe they owe too much debt to leave. Maybe there are threats against their family if they try to leave. Um, so, that gives, uh, so that's the basic definition of human trafficking under the federal law. And what percentage of the farm worker community would you say is, would then be characterized as trafficked labor? It's a very good question. It's probably, in terms of using a strict definition of trafficking, it's probably a fairly small percentage, although when you're talking about something as severe as essentially slavery, a small percentage is far more than is socially acceptable in our eyes. If you use a broad definition of trafficking, you, you can really get into a very high percentage of farm workers because the fact is that farm work has always been a brutal job. It began in this country with slavery, with, um, with African slaves brought here in the beginning one in the 17th century. And today, it's still the fact that most farm workers do have the conditions of their work misrepresented to them. Most of them are being employed through some sort of coercive means. Most of them are being exploited pretty severely. And so the fact is that there is, there is a lot of gray area between the normal, I'm sad to say, normal exploitation of farm workers and when you step into the line where someone would legally be considered a human trafficking victim. And Renan, what are the agricultural and economic conditions? Can you set up what's <coughs> happening that enables this to take place? Sure. Um, well, the idea is that every time you, um, you criminalize somebody's status, in this case their, their immigrant status, then you, you're setting up fertile ground for for abuses, for predatory behavior by, by oppressive people. Like in the case of farm workers, they find themselves uh, very isolated, not knowing the language. Uh, and the biggest part of it all is in constant fear that they may be picked up by, by um, uh, ICE, which is now, uh, it okay. used to be INS, now it's ICE. Um, so basically, they can easily be made to do things under the threat of, well, you know, we're going to call immigration on you, and stuff like that. So, that's that's that what causes and, and and like Owen was saying, agriculture as a whole has always historically been one um, sort of that goes along with with slavery. In the case of, of farm workers today, um, you can easily see patterns of migration of farm workers that are coming from areas where we need their natural resources. For example, Mexico or or where there's a, a war in in Central America. Or, so they're already coming as victims, whether it is of of uh, civil wars or whether it is of of uh, manipulating displacement of, of populations for exploitation of natural resources. So once they come here as victims, then they get victimized even more so. You know I mean? Because they, they are really scared. You know, they're mm -hmm. really scared to go back to the conditions that they came from. Mm -hmm. They're victimized and then criminalized because then the whole community is made to think that these are the people to fear. These are the aliens. They're dangerous. And, and we're not buying that. And we're going to come back and talk more about this. Indie TV, stay tuned. Thanks. Oh, hi. I'm Steve Heiss. I'm the producer and editor of the Indie Media Newsreel, which is the program you're watching right now. Or, well, I mean... Very, very important message. So listen very carefully. Not now, now. Because now, now, I'm recording this, and then I have to edit it. And But, but I mean, for your now, right now, as you're watching this, it's now. Um, well, anyway, um... Newsreel is a monthly program that's been in production for about seven years. Every month, activist video producers from around the country, around the world even, send in video segments about events in their communities. Events where people are standing up for what they believe in and trying to make a difference in the world. However, we have a problem. Lately, for whatever reason, when I sit down toward the end of the month to work on putting together the next month's program, I look at the pile of submissions sent to me and, well, that pile's been pretty empty. For some reason, people just aren't sending very much in. And I'm not sure why, but I need contributions to make the show happen. I can't just make it out of thin air. I need other people's documentaries. Little documentaries. Two minutes, five minutes, ten minutes about things going on around them in their communities. So if you're watching this and you like this program, maybe you can help. Maybe you make videos or know someone who does. Someone who's involved with a local struggle 
and wants to document that struggle. Or maybe someone who's already making short little documentaries and wants more opportunities to get the word out about what they're doing. There's more details about this project at newsreel.indymedia.org. Help spread the word. Thanks for your help and thanks for watching. Bye. We're back in DTV. And today we're talking about human trafficking, which is happening within the farm worker community and probably other communities as well of, uh, um, you know, vulnerable uh, migrant populations, immigrant populations. And we're really focusing on the farm worker community, talking with farm worker legal services advocates against anti-human uh, trafficking. So t we're going to continue this now with um, a case that happened in New York that set an important precedent, the Maria Garcia. Garcia case. Uh, Renan, can you explain what happened with that? Yeah, th this was the actually the first case, and, and we brought it, the first case under the, the new laws that were being passed at the time in 2000, 2001, um, for victims of, of trafficking. And uh, it gave it, it gave us a, an idea of how things were happening after we did a lot of the interviews of, of, the, of the victims. We realized how the whole thing took place. Um, Maria Garcia and her family were contractors. We call them crew leaders. And what basically happened is that she had connections, her and her sons had connections in the Arizona um, desert area where many migrants would, after crossing the border, they would go to sort of like um, home ground uh, trailers where they would be held and just wait for contractors to come and pick them out and say, like, you know, I want 40 workers, I want 20 workers. Um, in the case of Maria Garcia, she was basically um, importing workers from Arizona all the way to New York, um, sometimes 30, sometimes 40, sometimes say 50 workers. Every year there was like a lot of workers. And what she basically had them do is work for a period of time with little or no pay, supposedly to, to pay back the, the debt that she and her sons bought from crossing over and then the debt of coming all the way to the state of New York. It's indentured servitude. It's Europeans Definitely. coming over, having Definitely. someone else buy their way, and then staying in those conditions. Mm -hmm. And how long are people, you know, bought, you know, have to keep selling their labor for? There's no real number there. I mean, it, it could it could be forever if they really wanted to take it that way. I mean, and in the case of Maria Garcia, what what made it really, really um, obvious for us that it was a, a case that we needed to to investigate was she had um, the workers basically unable to move. It was just from work to the house or the houses that she had and then back to work uh, under the, the idea that, listen, if you're going to get picked up by immigration, then who's going to pay me back my debt? Therefore, you cannot leave the house. Therefore, you cannot go do groceries. Therefore, you're going to stay here and I'm going to have people outside guarding you. You know what I mean? You get told where to sleep, where to eat, when to eat, when to sleep. Uh, when everything was very much controlled. And there was also some signs of, of physical force as well. And was this the set of precedent that nothing on this scale had been seen or had been um, busted before? Or how did that Well, not here place? in the state of New York. This was the first, the first case. I mean, and, and it really caught up, brought attention nationwide, and then eventually a lot of cases started coming. Were there some changes that happened because of this once it well, was busted? Well, yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of good, good uh, laws being passed. I think the state of New York has come up with some great uh, law to, to protect uh, victims of trafficking. I mean, right now there's there's things like, for example, the T visa, which gives protection to the victims of trafficking, that it, it allows them to have uh, many federal benefits to basically get their life back together, as well as, as um, some temporary stay here in the United States, at least uh, while the, the investigation is going. For, for their case. So there's been a few changes, but let's get, like really try to picture how this happens. Um, people leaving their home country mm -hmm. under what conditions are they leaving their countries? What are they expecting when they come here? The so-called American dream or what they're told it will be like and then what it's like and then how they get wrapped up in this. They're imprisoned in their working conditions right. and they're victimized in a variety of ways that you've talked about. So how then you know, let's take us from them coming to what happens once we find out about this. Sure, and it's important to note that um, not all victims of human trafficking, even in the farm worker community, are foreign born. There are victims within the country, and uh, maybe we can get, if we have time, we can do some examples of those cases also. 
but uh, the Marie Garcia case that Renan was describing is a fairly typical example of how someone gets into debt bondage, which is one form of trafficking, which is generally someone coming from a country poorer than this one, from whether it's Guatemala or Mexico, and the farther you have to travel, the worse the trip is going to be, the more dangerous and the more money you're spending to get here. Because there's virtually no legal way for a farm worker to come to this country and work, they often rack up a lot of fees crossing the border. So maybe they're paying someone to set them up with a coyote, a smuggler. They're paying the coyote to take them across the border. They're paying someone for a ride. And it might all be the same person. It might be a different person each step for a ride up to New York State, for example. And so once they arrive here, maybe paying to be set up with a job once they get here. So once they arrive, they have these thousands of dollars of debt, which are often, it's often this very nebulous debt. Um, you mentioned indentured servitude, and that was a brutal thing at the start of this country. But with indentured servitude, there was some sort of clear path, at least theoretically, of how you're supposed to get out of that and become a normal part of society. With this situation, there's really there's no chance of that. You come here with this money, you start paying it back. But the problem is, as with the Maria Garcia case, when a worker says after a few months, OK, can I see my debt now? Can, I, can you tell me how much I've paid off? It's, well, your debt really hasn't gone down any, or I'm not going to show you that, or shut up and get back to work. Um, there's really no, it's not like there's a clear principle and a clear interest rate. It's nothing like legitimate, uh, like a legitimate debt. And so once someone gets into that situation, at that point, it becomes easier and easier, especially if they're an immigrant without status who can be, um, who can be, told, who can be instilled with even more fear, with the fear of being picked up by immigration. It becomes easy to basically make them do whatever you want. And that might be working for free. That might be working in really brutal conditions a as a farm laborer. That might be uh, performing sex acts, either for money or not. Sometimes farm worker women are working as farm workers by day and then being forced to perform sex acts on other farm workers or people coming from urban areas by night. So really, it's this basic situation that once you're in that situation, once you feel like someone has complete control over you because they, you owe them this money, whether it's real or not, and they can hurt someone back home or they convince you that they can hurt someone back home or hurt you here if you don't do what they want you to do, then there's really no limit to what they can make you do. Mm -hmm. And the growers and the farm owners, how much are they aware of what's going on? And when we get back, we're going to talk. We need to take a break, but we're going to talk about this tiered system because there's who's on the top, who's benefiting from this, who the owners are, the farm owners, the um, crew leaders, and the supervisors. We'll be back in a minute. lights on in here? If you need light to access this building, you can have your doctor certify your disability, then ask for special accommodation. Equal access is a right, not a privilege. I'm John Schorsch. I'm Sarah Green. I'm Deborah Peterson. And I'm Donna Lawrence. Ow! Oof! Indie TV, back at you. Uh, we're talking now in this last segment of the show today after we've kind of profiled who the farm workers are that are getting stuck in this vicious cycle of human trafficking and pretty much uh, imprisonment in their working conditions and then still completely disregarded within the community and society and ultimately offered nothing at the end of this um, you know, this criminal process that they're exploited by. And who is benefiting in this? I mean, there is a tiered system at work here. Uh, what I want to know is the growers, the local growers, and the crew leaders, and the uh, supervisors. Who, are, who can we hold responsible, and how can we break this down, and how is that happening, Renan? Well, first of all, you gotta, we got to note that agriculture is the backbone of the economy. It's the number one industry here in the, in the state of New York, for example. So the number one benefactor is going to be the the U.S. economy. Uh, then you have the the growers who are land owners and historically once again if you own land you enter a system of hierarchy which places you uh, and at the top. Then you have um, crew leaders or contractors which for the most part were farm workers at some point and then either they learned English so they learned to communicate with other workers and became helpful to the farmer um, 
or are just simply people that are very aware of where to find uh, workers. So they can offer a, farm, a farmer, listen, I can get you this amount of workers if you give me this amount of money per worker. So um, there's, there's a good argument that the, the crew leaders, the contractors, can make a substantially good amount of money, basically because they're charging the, the workers, they're charging the grower, um, they're charging for cashing checks, they're charging for transportation. Uh, and, and that's basically the, the system that's been set up. Well, I would like to ask about that because you're saying who's benefiting, it's really the economy. I mean, the backbone, the agricultural mm -hmm. industry is the backbone as the food provider and some of the hardest work in this country yeah. and the obviously not only not recognized, but just absolutely no uh, safety net for right. these people at all. How, um, how that money, because the myth is that these farm workers and immigrants and migrants, they're you know, hurting our economy and they're taking, could you speak right. to that? That's well, I, I think Owen can, can get more into, into the statistics, but just to, to give you an idea, let's say that there's 80,000 undocumented workers in, in the northwestern part of the state of New York, let's just say. Uh, and because of the fact that they still get a paycheck, they still have to fill out I-9 forms, whether it's with false social security numbers or anything, um, they get the deductions that you and I get. And because of the fact that the majority of them want to work as many hours as possible and 16 hours, 17 hour days, then their deductions are going to be an average of $100 a week. $100 times 80,000, you're talking about $8 million that are staying and where are they going type of thing. You know what I mean? So that's another contribution to the economy that we don't really talk about. Like they're really basically supporting the social security system. I know Owen has some good statistics. Right. As of 2005, it was estimated that the amount of money uh, undocumented immigrants were paying into the systems and not taking out amounted to a $5 billion surplus annually for Social Security and $8 billion annually for Medicare. So huge amounts that are not, that are being a, essentially a gift to the system that those workers will never reap the benefits of. Mm -hmm. And that's another question. How are the most violated and exploited being turned into, now they're the, they're the predators somehow, they're preying <laughs> on our economic system. But uh, I'd like to, before you know the show, we're going to run out of time here, but the Department of Labor and what's happening legally to protect workers. Are there any laws coming down? Have, has anything been implemented? What's happening? New York State passed a very strong anti-trafficking law, one of the strongest in the country last November, just this past year, which is a, a really great sign. It means more benefits coming from state public money for victims. It means more state agencies that are training on the problem of trafficking and looking for victims, looking to help victims. There are much stronger regulations needed in terms of farm worker safety. Farm workers are excluded from the Federal Labor Standards Act or Fair Labor Standards Act in terms of overtime. A lot of health and safety regulations are excluded from. All of that needs to change. They are excluded from the right to collective bargaining under the uh, labor, la uh, Federal Labor Relations Act. Uh, New Deal legislation that covers almost every other worker in the country. But honestly, such a huge problem is just the lack of enforcement of the laws that exist now. In addition to those changes that need to happen, if the government would provide the, the human power on the ground to enforce the laws that we have now, we'd be so much closer to a just and healthy system. The fact is, um, I know in the state of Florida, there's one person working for the Federal Occupation Safety and Health Administration who is charged with inspecting farm worker housing. And it's not much better than that in New York State. You have a handful of people, literally, you know, can count them on two hands, whose job it is to go out and to these hundreds, thousands of farms and make sure that things are okay, that workers are okay, that their needs are being taken care of, if their rights are being violated, explaining their rights to them and helping them rectify the situation. All these laws are on the books that protect these workers from those situations that are not realistically enforceable with the number of representatives from the Department of Labor and without the political will to bring problems forward to attack the growers if growers, the farm owners, are doing irresponsible things if they're abusing their workers. As Renan said, it's a huge part of the economy of the state. So to get a Department of Labor that is willing to take on such a powerful economic interest and say, look, you need to step up, you need to make sure that people in your industry are not being regularly exploited, that is a, a huge barrier we have to cross still. And what can uh, the barefoot uh, viewers, or even those with shoes on out there, what can people do in the community as far as being supportive, being an advocate, you know, just not falling in, at least to the imagery that they're getting all the time? The Sure. I mean, right off the bat, the first thing that comes to mind is just getting involved in the community. One of the biggest problems, like Renan mentioned, is the isolation of farm workers from the other communities. I know most people in Rochester don't know that there are farm workers a 10-minute drive outside Rochester. So whether people in Rochester or in the rural areas, looking around, who are your community service organizations, whether faith-based or some other kind of basis, um, 
can you go out there, can you volunteer, can you do some valuable services and meet farm workers face to face and realize these people are part of your community? Yeah, there's, yeah. A, there's a pretty good network. There's a, if you're interested in the, the medical field, for example, there's mm -hmm. migrant clinics that serve the farm workers. There's migrant education that teach English as a second language. Like uh, Owen said, there's the ministry. You know, I mean, there's legal services. So if, you, if, if involvement is what you're looking for, there's definitely a need for it. I mean, and we'll put the contact information sure. up for Farmworker Legal Services. We'll get all that out. Our show is coming to an end. And in the spirit of community TV, we always end with a handshake or a hug. I want to hug you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And being